All right, thank everyone for being here. Uh, thanks for joining us in the 2024 Sloan Sports Analytics Conference Competitive Advantage Room presented by CAGR, the Craft Analytics Group. My name is Grant Anhorn. I'm a first year MBA student here at MIT Sloan and could not be more excited to introduce Natalie. Uh, her talk today is called The Research Collectives, The Call for Large Scale Open Science Initiatives and in Sports Sciences. Uh, Natalie, uh, welcome to stage. Thank you. Hello, thank you for having me. It's always a pleasure to be here at Sloan Sports Analytics. I'm always excited when there's a fellow Wahoo uh, inviting me up on stage. Uh, so today, I'm gonna to talk to you, like he said, about research collectives and the call for large-scale open science initiatives in sports science. And specifically today, I'll be speaking about collectives around athlete health and safety. So I first also want to speak a little bit about what do I mean by collectives? Um, when I think about collectives, I'm thinking, how do we bring together brain power, resources, and data to answer questions that we can't answer on our own and answer questions that really are going to move the state forward and you know, make a positive impact in sports? So during the talk, I'm going to first start with a brief history of research in athlete monitoring. So we're all kind of on the same page of where this has been in the past. Uh, then we're going to take a quick divot and look at, um, or pivot, I should say, uh, and look at uh, what daily athlete monitoring looks like at UVA men's basketball. And then last, we'll talk about the call for research collectives in sports, um, my vision at UVA, and what we're doing uh, amongst us peers in the ACC to move this forward. So around 2015, we saw the emergence of wearable technology in the United States. It had been going on overseas for a while, uh, but about 2015-ish is where we saw uh, specifically teams in the United States take on wearable technologies. These t uh, wearables companies were telling us things like, oh, you know, it's going to help you improve player performance. You're going to be able to track athlete workloads. Oh, and you're going to be able to predict injury. Coaches are salivating. Everybody wants to predict injury. At the same time, as the wearables are coming up, we're seeing um, democratization of machine learning through programs like Scikit-Learn which is making it so people with a data set can you know, do a little Python and get machine learning results pretty easily without much technical training. Uh, the convergence of these wearables and machine learning brought us a lot of research articles that confirmed you can predict injury with wearables. However, there's a lot of concerning things within these papers. So myself and uh, Jay Hurdle set out to analyze the research that was out there. We specifically looked at GPS uh, technologies on team-based um, team field sports, so a very niche sport population. And looking through all these articles, um, we found no conclusive evidence that there was any reason we should be using wearable technologies uh, to predict injury. It wasn't happening like these research articles were saying they were. So why, why did we make this conclusion? Uh, first was because of disparate methods of injury tracking. Teams were tracking injuries extremely differently um, across these papers. So we couldn't really say that uh, the results were similar across teams. Uh, next was statistical analysis, and I mentioned this with the machine learning. Uh, uh, in sports injury is not a peer prediction problem, but yet we had people trying to make it a peer prediction problem using things like machine learning, and that's not the best way to approach injury. Uh, humans are highly probabilistic, and so are their injuries. Uh, and then next was just overambitious claims of a new technology from a relatively small sample size. We were looking at you know, single sports teams of like 15 people for one season, which isn't a large sample size. Uh, so we had overambitious claims from the technology companies. We had overambitious claims from researchers. And that has a lot to do with how publishing works. Often, researchers are asked to make really ambitious claims in their studies, whether or not that's what the data really says. And we could have a whole conference on academic publishing and the problems there, but that's all I'll say. Um, but then, you're so now you're looking at me and you're saying, well, Natalie, you're telling me that wearables don't help us predict injury. However, I've maybe seen some of your work. I know that every day 
you are using wearable technologies with the teams that you work with, and you are absolutely correct. So in my role at UVA, I sit on the faculty of data science, uh, but I also work as a sports scientist with many of the athletic teams there. And I walk into coaches' offices and I ask them, you know, what's working for you? And they always talk about the technology. Something is working for them and they feel like it's helping them prevent injuries. It's helping them train their athletes on and off the field. And I think that that anecdotal research or that anecdotal stories are so important to helping us guide the hypotheses and ideas and that we need to be researching. So we're going to take a little divot here, a little, I keep saying divot, I must like want to go golf, that's how my golf game is, lots of divots. Um, we're going to take a little pivot here. Um, so I worked a lot with the men's basketball team and I'd love to show you kind of an injury profile with technology, uh, but given some uh, privacy issues, I'm going to show you a, uh, uh, a performance uh, uh, kind of story in the basketball team. Uh, and at UVA, we really feel like if we can optimize somebody's readiness and performance, the trickle-down effect is going to be mitigation of, of injuries, specifically fatigue and overuse injuries. Um, so many of you probably know who this is on the screen. This is DeAndre Hunter. He was one of the great basketball players um, that have come out of UVA. Um, he was with us for a couple years and was on the 2019 uh, championship team. DeAndre came to UVA with a lot of uh, basketball prowess. He was a great basketball player, everyone knew it. However, he had a lot of physical capabilities he could improve upon, especially if he wanted to go to the NBA. So over his years with us, he was able to put on 24 pounds of basically pure muscle, uh, decrease his body fat, and increase his vertical uh, jump despite putting on extra mass. And he did this because of his work ethic and all of the work he put in to making himself a better athlete, but also with the help of our performance coaches and um, technology that we use at UVA. Where this data is collected is called the Good Stewards um, Basketball Performance Center. That's the entrance right here. So I'm gonna talk you through kind of what a daily monitoring session looks like for us on a day where we are both collecting data, I'm not sorry, we're always collecting data, on a day where we're lifting and a day when we are also practicing in the afternoon. So athletes will come in in the morning, they first fill out a wellness questionnaire. This questionnaire will ask them, where are you sore? It asks them how much they perceived they slept uh, and different dimensions of wellness. Many of our athletes opt into wearing an aura ring. So at this time, the data is downloaded and we put everything into dashboards. We're really uh, dashboard crazy at UVA. Coaches really like dashboards. Um, and so it goes into dashboards that look like this. So our coaches, specifically our performance coaches, can take a quick look and get an idea of where the team is at for that day. They move on with their warm-ups. Oh, let me step back. In addition to a daily look, we're also tracking these trends um, over time to see what they look like over time. So the guys go warm up, then they come back over and they're gonna do counter movement jumps on force plates. Uh, counter movement jumps allow us to assess neuromuscular readiness. So many of you, everyone here works with athletes, knows athletes, or was an athlete, is an athlete. Uh, athletes are extremely adaptable. And even if they are feeling really fatigued, if I tell them to jump as high as they can, they're gonna jump as high as they can. Um, so we can't always look at fatigue from are they just not jumping as high? What the force plates allow us to do is look at strategy changes. So how are they changing their jump strategy to achieve that max output? And in those strategy changes, we can assess different kinds of fatigue. Again, it goes into a dashboard um, that is you know, color-coded for the coaches, get, allows them to get quick looks at the data. So now our performance coaches are taking all of this into account as the athletes are moving to their, their weight racks. Um, if the coaches feel like there needs to be changes to the weight routine, um, let's say a guy wakes up, slept really well, he, maybe he slept really well the last few nights, he's feeling great, we don't have a game for a few days, maybe they're gonna push him a little harder that day, increase the weight, increase the intensity of his lift. And on the, the opposite of that, a guy could come in um, not, being, not feeling so great, maybe he's feeling um, you know, a bit anxious, a bit antsy, we realize that he's having some central nervous fatigue, so we're gonna maybe take out any Olympic weightlifting moves that are in his, his um, weightlifting routine for that day to help give his CNS a rest. Um, the circles there show some of the technology that's in our racks. 
Um, at the top there is a perch camera uh, that's tracking barbell uh, speed and velocity. Uh, we use this both for goal setting, but then also to track fatigue while they're lifting. And then there's a couple iPads that are giving them their next exercises, they're marking off what they're doing. Um, and then it's also giving them the data from the perch camera. There's also, we have uh, force plates in the, the racks too if we need to. Um, so the guys finish their lifting routine, they go eat breakfast, they go off and do the student part of being a student athlete. Uh, the performance coaches and sports coaches are now maybe having a quick phone call. How are the guys feeling today? What was practice like yesterday, maybe the day before? What's coming up next? What should practice look like today? And usually the coaches want to know things like, how many minutes can I practice today without you know, burning, or, you know, burying the guys in a hole they can't get out of before the next game? Uh, so the guys come back after classes, maybe watch film, do that type of stuff. They warm up again. Before they enter the court, they're putting on their catapult devices. Uh, UVA, we're still wearing our catapult devices uh, between the shoulder blades. I know many teams have moved to the hip. Uh, they practice. We have GAs doing all the data collection during practice. Uh, and that night, it's put into a database for the performance coaches to look at to start making adjustments and recommendations for the next coming days. And also to look back to see, did we hit the benchmarks we wanted to in the practice session? OK, so we have all this data. And so now kind of back on the research side, we're trying to now fit this into different modeling models that we know of injury and readiness. So. Um, on the left-hand side here is a model of overuse injury by Calcovin. It's really small up there, but it's, I think it's open source if you want to look at it yourself. What I like about this is that it takes into account individual physiology, injury and adaptation, and all of the biomechanical uh, stresses that are imposed upon athletes. On the other side is um, a model that we use at UVA to talk to athletes, and it focuses mostly on optimal readiness. What are all the things that need to uh, come together to make you an optimal athlete? Um, and we really feel like if we're focusing on optimal readiness, and from a modeling perspective, I feel like there's more signal and readiness than an injury, um, that's going to have a trickle-down effect to decreasing your likelihood of overuse or fatigue-related related injuries. Um, so now you're thinking, you have all this data. You have models that you can start to work the data with and understand how it works together. Why can't you make any evidence-based recommendations? And that comes to uh, what we call the hierarchy of evidence. And any of the other academics in the room are probably very familiar with this pyramid. So as we move up the pyramid, we have better evidence. So the very bottom is, is background and expert opinion. That's me standing up here telling you what I think. And then we move up from there. In sports, we often have a lot of um, observational research. So athletes go, they do stuff, we're tracking them. And then we kind of just hope we can see something just observationally watching them. Maybe we have two athletes diverge and there can be some kind of natural experiment there. Uh, but sports is not a place where we can do randomized controlled trials. Um, it's really hard for me to go to a coach and say, I'm just going to hold this guy out because I want to see what's going to happen. I'm going to get laughed at. Um, uh, so we, it's hard to do randomized controlled trials with at the top of that bottom part. Uh, so then all of our uh, research when it comes to observational is kind of in that cohort study region, but it's usually small sample sizes. And again, we're not great at sharing the methods and sharing the data. So it's really hard to move up um, collectively into systematic reviews and meta-analyses. Meta-analyses are where we can kind of add data together from across different studies. Uh, but we make that really hard in the sports literature. But this is where collectives can really come in and help. So at uh, UVA, I run something called the Sports Science and Analytics Collective. This collective is a little broader than just athlete health. At UVA, we're bringing together all the faculty who have interest in sports, our athletics department, our students, our industry partners, to think about ways that we can uh, bring all of those, the brain power, the resources, the data uh, together to move forward everything from ticketing and marketing to uh, athlete performance to tactics. One of the biggest projects we're working on right now is the portal for basketball, um, which if anyone knows portal data, it's uh, not the easiest and most fun project, but it's an amazing data project, which I love. Um, so now how can we take this and look at it in athlete 
health. Um, so um, one of the things we're working on at UVA also is working with our peers in the ACC to talk about can we start to now bring together the biometric data that we're collecting on our athletes for their health, for their performance, for their safety, and find ways to bring that data together. Forget about competitive advantage. Let's just focus on making our athletes in the ACC the, the most ready and optimally, and optimal athletes that we can. Uh, and so we've started these conversations and hopefully stuff will move, move forward. So what do we get besides research papers uh, when we put collectives together? Because um, even though I'm faculty and publishing papers is supposed to be something I think about a lot, it's actually the thing I think about the least. Um, I would much rather the work I do positively affect athletes and give products back to athletes and the clinicians and practitioners that work with them versus a paper that maybe 2% of this room reads obscurely on whatever uh, site you found it on. Um, and so I, it's gonna be more than this research papers, but when I put research in the word, people often think, oh, you just wanna like study us. Um, so what do we get? First and foremost, I think best practices. I talk to a lot of people who are using wearables and they say, you know what, I don't even know what best practices are in collecting data on our athletes. How, are, how do we clean the data? How, what variables are important? What variables are we making you know, beyond what's given to us? Um, and like, where do I get started? And that leads into um, FAIR principles. If we have best practices out there, that also allows athletes to understand best practices and has conversation starters um, with people collecting data about, are you using best practices when you're collecting data on me in terms of privacy and um, use cases of that data? Um, it also allows for, um, I should also say what FAIR means, for those of you who aren't familiar. FAIR stands for findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable data. And so this is, if we're all kind of collecting data in a similar way, and I, me and my students might have code that helps model that data, we might not be able to make UVA's data accessible, but we can make the code that we use to run our models for athlete readiness accessible for everybody. So you don't have to have a team of faculty and students. You can go to our website and find that data, um, find that code and run your own models. It um, also brings together multi-site research. So how can we now not think about adding our data together later on, but how can we come up with ideas and hypotheses together and systematically uh, collect and research that data together? And then longitudinal research. So this has become even more important in the era of the portal. Uh, often we only have an athlete for a little bit. They can easily now bounce to other institutions and then we lose that data. Uh, we don't you know, have four years of a full data set on an athlete any longer. Um, it's also important that that athlete you know, has some ideas on can they port that data with them when they move on. Um, and then also looking over the lifespan. So we have athletes who go on to the pros. That's great, their data should go with them there. But what about the athletes who we don't, just don't want to have arthritis in their knees when they're 35? How can we start to track our athletes long-term and make sure that they're healthy and active you know, throughout their lifespan? So all sounds great. How do we do it? First and foremost is funding, and funding drives all these other, other areas. Um, we'll need data architecture and data agreements, research oversight and consent. I'm all about transparency amongst researchers and amongst the, the participants that we use in our research. Um, and then the data architecture is really important. We need data governance, metadata, um, and understand really who's looking at that data and how we make it all transparent. Um, and then hopefully put together our really big ideas, talk about them, and put them out there for everyone, including the athletes, uh, to use. Uh, so a big thank you to all my, all my collaborators and funders, and that's my contact information. Um, but I'm happy to take questions now also. One is, what, what do the coaches and athletic department think of this? Do they think you're giving away secrets that yeah. uh, you shouldn't be? And then second, do you think um, this sort of model, I could see this actually working very well at the pro level where the players yeah. associations yeah. Might, could negotiate for this and kind of mandate this with the leagues? Yeah, so for your first question, how do athletic departments feel? Uh, 
that's usually, we've been talking about these concepts for years now, and that's usually the hang up is, oh, we don't wanna give away competitive advantage. But I think now we're at a point where we've had this type of data for a long time and we realize by the time that the academics get to it, the competitive advantage is gone especially when we're just looking at the biometric data for health and safety. And I think we could create some, some use cases for people to see that we don't have any competitive advantage by putting this together. It's actually only making us more competitive because I'm a big, I'm a big believer in you know, high tide makes all boats rise. So if we have, if the ACC has their best athletes on the court, on the field all the time, that's better for everyone, it's better for competition. Um, and then your second question with the pro leagues, the pros are already doing something similar to this. They do some research um, at the league level um, and then they work with the, the players associations and often have uh, like research companies contracted to do, to do that work. How that feeds back to athletes individually or teams individually is different between the leagues, but yeah. Yeah. Hi, uh, great Hi. presentation. Curtis Thanks. Goss, USA Swimming. Um, I was wondering, I think this is really awesome. This is a really cool initiative. Uh, what I kind of see coming is this sort of, we're like looking at all of this technological data, all of this biometric information is becoming more and more and more about the digital athlete. Um, yeah. I was wondering how kind of the human element fits into your vision for this research collective, and how we can use this to enhance conversations between coaches, athletes, practitioners, rather than replace them. Yeah, so you're talking about the digital, like the digital athlete as in like the simulations that we can run to look at the different scenarios? Or just in the sense of, uh, it's rare to see a piece of technology outperform a wellness questionnaire or even a very well-guided conversation between yeah. practitioner, coach, and athlete. Yeah. Is how do we make sure that we're not getting farther away from all of the insights from that human connection yeah. as opposed to just mm -hmm. sitting with the iPad and the coach sees the iPad yeah. and then has their yeah. insight without talking. To totally. And so the, the wellness data that we are collecting at UVA, um, I would love to say that I get tons of insights from it. And it is, it's never made it into any of our models because it does, doesn't look great. But what does it do? It's a great conversation starter. We're like, oh, you marked this. Like, what's, what's going on? And so I agree that a lot of the technologies are better conversation starters than they are like pieces of the puzzle. And so what, we've, what we think about a lot in my lab too is how do we start to quantify those conversations? Um, but that's why we all love sports, right? There's a big intuition, intuition piece. And uh, we talk a lot about, you know, how do we start to you know, quantify grit and all of these other things, and it is so hard. But sometimes I, I often wonder, are those things we wanna solve? Are those kind of the mysteries of sport that make sport so, so amazing? Um, so I, I don't know, I, AI is hard because I don't know how fast AI is gonna move. Uh, but I can see where we get less and less human. Um, I hope it doesn't happen that way. And I always wanna keep that human connection. And I, th I think uh, you know, keeping the human in the loop on many of this is, is a, a, crucial, a crucial part of the, of, the, of the whole ecosystem, yeah. Hey, so I'm Christy Boyer. I'm a, uh, oh, there, I was like, I can't see. <laughs> hey, I'm a computer science professor at the University of Florida. I might be your counterpart at the University of Florida Great. for doing a similar thing. Um, I have so many thoughts about the previous question, but I'll just ask my question, which is, could you say a little more about what stage you are in this? Like, how much is this an idea versus something that's happening on the ground already? Which, the collective part? Yes. It is an idea. We've put in for funding from a few different sources. Um, everyone's more willing to talk when I can say that no one has to put in money. <laughs> um, and then the, some of our counterparts in the ACC are hoping to meet in person once the seasons slow down to actually talk about the legitimacy of doing this. Um, we've been talking about it for probably four years and this will be the first year we maybe are actually gonna sit down and say, is this even a feasible thing to do? Yeah. but. Um, like I said, I think we're not at the point with the technology where people are willing to have those conversations and we're less worried about competitive advantage. I think we've all had it long enough to realize there's not a lot of competitive advantage issues when we look at this data. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. hi. Hey. Um, my name's Brad, Brad Stenger. I'm a researcher at the University of Vermont. Do you talk a little bit about privacy and the steps you're taking to preserve athletes' um, personal information and privacy? Yeah. So. A lot of that is still a thought if we do collectives and add it together how we are going to do that. And I think um, 
we're more at the stage where we'll bring in a partner who already has really good data governance policies in place uh, to help us with that versus trying to build something ourselves. I think it'll be much more scalable if we bring in a partner that already does some of that work. Um, and then, because, because we can't just identify it and pull it in, right? It's longitudinal data. So we still have to have some kind of marker that allows us to connect the athlete over time. Um, and then there's, I mean, data governance is at the top of, of that. And I think that will cover the privacy issues. Um, we've also talked about like ideas of like, federated learning uh, to do this. Um, but again, I think we'd have to use an, uh, a partner to help us do that, to, to scale it. I mean, we could build it on prem at UVA, but I don't know how scalable it will be then if it's just, just me and the, the servers at UVA. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Hi. Uh, similar to the question before about keeping the human in the loop, something that I think about a lot is making sure research and data goes back into implementation and usage yeah. by the coaches and athletes. How do you think about that in your work with the basketball team? Yeah. So, like similar to what I said, um, I think a lot. I think a lot less about publishing papers, and I think a lot more about products I can make that people use every single day. Um, and we do a lot of, you know immediate feedback with coaches. So we build things and we want to get immediate feedback from the users to keep developing those. I don't know, they, love, they love a dashboard. So how do we develop those dashboards? And they're using them. And you know, I really should do some like A-B testing on the dashboards when I have more time. Um, and then, uh, sorry, I lost my, lost my train of thought there. Uh, so yeah, I think that is the most important part is building something that the people, at, the end user is going to use, whether the end user is a performance coach, a sport coach, or, or an athlete. I think more and more are thinking about how can the athletes leverage their data. I don't think they need to be out of the loop on these conversations anymore. We have super bright, super intellectual athletes who are curious about their data. And so how are we also building products for them um, to, A, you know, make themselves uh, better to do whatever they want to do next in their career, um, but also keep us in check and say, hey, I don't understand why you're making decisions based on my data like this when I'm looking at it from this angle. Um, I think that's super important to have that, um, those conversations and uh, you know, healthy, where the word banter is coming to mind, that's not what I'm looking for, the healthy discourse, there we go, yeah. All right, well, thank you so much, Natalie. Um, yeah, if thank you, you have any further questions, she'll be in the hallway.